Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Um, those of you that prayed for the uh, storm to disappear, well, it was a non-event. Uh, thank you. And uh, please keep me in your prayers. I've been kind of depressed lately. You know, I've known since 1990 that I would possibly have to give up my life for the faith. That's not the problem. Just looking at the country and knowing it's under judgment. And it's, you know, read the book of uh, Lamentations of Jeremiah. That's kind of how I'm, where I'm at right now. Uh, you know, I've really served the devil a little about half my life. And, uh, well, you know what? It's, uh, it's been a mess. What can I tell you? So, uh, yeah. So please do that. All right, we're going to do part two of water. Now, in the book of Leviticus, chapters 15, chapter 16, and so on, uh, the priests and other people would uh, wash themselves with water, uh, kind of like a ceremony, ceremonially. Uh, I'm sure there's an application to that, you know. Uh, for example, the uh, sometimes they were supposed to uh, bathe themselves or wash their hands in running water. There was a guy named uh, Dr. Semmelweis, I think it's S-E-M-M-E-L, W-E-I-S-S. -S. He was a uh, Swiss. Switzerland's an interesting country. They have, uh, they border Austria, they border Italy, and they border France. Well, Switzerland doesn't even have their own language. Uh, part of the country speaks French, part of it speaks Italian, part of it speaks German, like Austria. Austria and Germany have always been like, you know, sort of like Canada and the United States, you know big brother and little brother. Um, Austria was a major power uh, probably 200 years ago. Uh, perhaps you've heard of the Austrian-Hungarian, Hungarian, Austro-Hungary power. Uh, but then after World War I, they split up Austria and uh, they didn't want the Germans to be too powerful there. But uh, Dr. Semmelweis, who was Swiss, and with a name like Semmelweis, he was probably German. That's why I brought it up. Um, he encouraged all the doctors to wash their hands in running water. and Because uh, all they would do is stick their hands in a basin. You know, they would deliver, uh, they would work on a patient that had, you know, pneumonia then wash their hands in a basin and then go deliver a baby. And then after that, they'd wash their hands in the same basin and then, you know. And patients were getting uh, cross-contamination and getting sick and dying. And uh, the other doctors had very high infant mortality rates, but Dr. Semmelweis had a very low infant mortality rate. And uh, the... Uh, the women that knew about this, well, they wanted Dr. Semmelweis to deliver their baby. And Dr. Semmelweis just kept saying, you know, wash your hands in running water like the Bible says to do. But they laughed him to scorn and they uh, gave him a lot of problems. I'm not sure if they kicked him out of the hospital or not. But, uh, you know, this was before the age of microscopes where they could see the bacteria on the hands. So you know, running water. But, uh, and uh, generally soap doesn't kill bacteria. What it does is it uh, washes it, uh, you know, the bacteria will stick to your hands. And what the soap does is causes it to unstick and then wash away. 
Unless, of course, you got antibacterial soap. But, uh, you know, generally ivory soap or something like that, it doesn't kill, kill bacteria. But uh, sometimes they were to wash in running water. Well, then there was a ritual ceremonies, you know, washing of clothes. And, uh, for example, if a man had relations, marital relations with his wife, um, he was to, uh, well, let's see. Uh, that is in Leviticus 15 and verse 18. Uh, they would wash themselves and then be unclean until the evening as far as, I guess, religious type, type uh, ceremonies like in the book of Leviticus. And there were certain times of the year where the Lord didn't want you to touch your wife. So, you know, it was kind of a... Well, it was an earthly thing with, a, I guess, a heavenly application. Just like when Moses uh, passed through the Red Sea, Paul likened that unto baptism. And, of course, baptism of water is what John gave for repentance of sins. And Jesus was to baptize us with fire and the Holy Ghost. So maybe there's a connection there. What do you think? But we'll get more to that later. Now, I'm not going to uh, go much into it. If you're interested, you can read it yourself. But there's an interesting thing in the book of Numbers, chapter 5, starting in verse 17. If a man was jealous of his wife and thought she was messing around, uh, he would take her and get to the priest and... Uh, so the priest would take holy water, put it in an earthen vessel, I guess clay, and uh, I guess some dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle, and put it in the water. And then what he would do is he would uh, say some things and then have the woman drink it. And if she was faithful, well, nothing would happen. But if she was unfaithful, then her, uh, I think her bowels were, would rot. And they would know that she was guilty. So, you know, I thought, wow, that was, uh, you know, but people don't read the Old Testament. And they don't know this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, in verse 22, 522, it says, uh, The water that causeth the curse would go into the bowels to make thy belly to swell and thy thigh to rot. And, uh, yeah, bitter water. So... You know, it's, uh, you know, water has a lot of different things in the Bible. We're going to do more on that in just a minute. All right, let's go through Isaiah chapter 8. I know I did a Isaiah series recently, but uh, this uh, this is kind of interesting, and it relates to the waters. Assyria is likened unto a river that's overflowing. Now remember, Assyria conquered northern Israel after they split from southern Judah and took them captive because, well, let's just say the Lord was P.O.'d. That's the uh, modern translation, I guess you could say. Uh, he was not happy with them. In Jeremiah 3.8, he divorced Israel, gave him a bill of divorce. Then in Jeremiah 31.31, 31, 31, he said that he'd make a new covenant with them. And uh, that's what happened. All right, Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 7. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth up upon them the waters of the river, the waters of the river, strong and many. Now, how can waters be strong and many? Even the king of Assyria. Now, this is what you call parallelism. And all his glory, he shall come up over all his channels and go over all his banks. You ever heard of a river bank? You ever heard of a, a, a river channel? 
And we're not talking about a TV channel. We're talking about a river. Uh, that's what a channel is. Verse 8. And he shall pass through Judah. He shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. And the reaching out of his wings, he shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. Now the word Emmanuel means God with us. And that's in um, the book of Matthew. I don't remember if it's in chapter 1, 2, 3, or 4, but it's there. Uh, now the Assyrians took not only Israel, but they also conquered part of Judah also. Now they tried to take Jerusalem. They surrounded it and they were starting a siege and then a angel of the Lord came and uh, smote 100, 185,000 troops dead. One angel of the Lord killed at 185,000. Yeah. So... Can you imagine how many graves that would be? I mean, the people of Jerusalem would, would have been busy for how long? Burying people? Can you imagine that in the summer? After three days, what it would smell like? Woohoo! Yeah, but they were spared captivity. And then uh, years later, I don't remember exactly how long approximately, but uh, the Babylonians came and took Jerusalem captive. So, and he shall pass through Judah, he shall overflow and go over, he shall reach even to the neck, and the outstretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land, O Emmanuel. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye, have, and ye, sh and ye shall be broken in pieces, and give ear all ye of far countries, gird yourselves. And ye shall be broken in pieces, gird yourselves, and ye shall be broken in pieces." I remember when I was in college, when the teacher said the same thing a couple times, pay attention, it was going to be on the test. Gird yourselves and ye shall be broken in pieces. Yeah. Take counsel together and it shall come to naught. Speak the word and it shall not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Say ye not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. What confederacy? Well, instead of these uh, Israel and Judah looking to the Lord for protection, uh, they wanted a confederacy or a confederation of their neighbors. For example, Egypt. Um, you know, you ever heard of the uh, Confederate States? Uh, they were a group. So instead of trusting the Lord, they trusted their neighbors who were probably even more wicked than they were. A confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Now, in the previous study, we studied it out, and, uh, you know, rock, that rock was Christ. Christ was the stone of stumbling. Uh, have you ever tripped on a rock? Well, that's what they did. That's what, you know, that's what Judah did. Uh, verse 15, And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken, and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, 
I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Verse 19. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits. I mean, you're talking, you know, bad spirits, evil spirits. And they're familiar. That means, you know, they're, they've consulted with them a lot. They're very familiar with them. They're not strangers. They're sort of kind of friendly with them, I guess you could say. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and under wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God? Should not a people seek unto their God? For the living to the dead. So, you're going to go to people consulting with the devils? Or should you seek after the God, your God, the living God, for the living to the dead, to the law and to the des testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And they shall pass through it, hardly bestead and hungry, and it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. Their God. You know, the, these wizard people. And they'll look upward. You know, when you're lying on your back and you got nowhere else to go, sadly, that's about the only time that some people will look up and honor the Lord. And they shall look unto the earth, and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. This is not so much a uh, part of the Bible lesson, but I thought, wow, this is beautiful. Isaiah 41, verse 17 and 18. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. Beautiful promise, huh? Somebody pointed out that uh, water was kind of likened unto the Holy Spirit, you know who you are. And uh, I never really caught that. I mean, once I looked at the verses, it was like, oh yeah, yeah, I, I never really caught that. But here it is in Isaiah 44 and verse 3. Here's a what they call parallelism. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. So, didn't Christ talk about uh, rivers of living water? Oh, yeah. We're going to be doing the uh, New Testament real, real shortly. Uh, look at this. I've never, you know, every time I do a Bible study like this, uh, you know, to me, this was uncharted territory, this uh, water study. I mean, I knew a few things, but it seems like every time I do a study, I find, I find new things, which uh, adds to my, I guess, you know, knowledge of the Lord. All glory to him, because it isn't anything to my glory that I know anything I know it's from him I mean if he doesn't give it to you you ain't going to get it that's just the way it is and I'm honored that he would put up with me for uh, all these years when I serve the devil and myself 
but uh, check this out. Jeremiah chapter 2. Very interesting. 11. Verse 11. I, Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. Listen to this carefully. For my people have committed two evils. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Wow. I thought that was only in Revelation and in the New Testament. I was wrong. They have forsaken me, the fountains, the fountain of living waters, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So not only did they forsook the Lord, when they tried to have some water, well, their container had a hole in it and it drained out. They were left high and dry. Verse 14. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? All right. Jeremiah 17, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord the fountain of living waters. And they that depart from me shall be written in the earth. Do we want our names written in the earth? Or do we want our names written in the book of life? You know what comes to mind when I've read this? Remember the woman taken in adultery, and they brought her before Jesus and said, we caught this woman, even in the very act. Yeah, you caught this woman in adultery. Well, where's the guy? I mean, she wasn't committing adultery by herself. Where was the guy that was, uh, you know, where was he? And what did Jesus do? He stooped down and wrote uh, into the earth. I wonder if he was writing their names. And they de that depart from me shall be written in the earth. I don't know. I just, that's just kind of a theory I'm just throwing out there. I'm not saying it's true. I'm not saying it's not. But it just came to mind. You know? And uh, maybe they grabbed her and brought him to her, the woman, the adulterous woman to Jesus because... Uh, maybe they'd all had her, and they were jealous because she was with somebody else. I don't know. All I know is they didn't bring the man. They only brought the woman, a bunch of hypocrites. And sometimes I'm a hypocrite too, so I don't have much room to talk. Yeah, You want to read a verse about uh, kind of how I feel? Lamentations of Jeremiah, chapter 3, verse 48. Mine eye runneth down with rivers of water. What kind of water comes out of your eyes? Tears, people. Mine eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction, for the destruction of the daughter of my people. Yeah. Lamentations 5.4, we have drunken our water for money. Can you imagine that? You're in your own land, your own country, and you're having to pay for your own water. Our wood is sold unto us. Guess what, people? China's buying up all the, a uh, lot of forest 
in the United States. They're selling us our own wood. Wow. All right, time for a little humor. Little Billy, after the uh, sermon, uh, okay, Little Billy's with his mom and dad at the church, and they just listen to the sermon of the pastor. And Little Billy goes up to the pastor and reaches in his pocket and pulls out a dollar and gives it to the pastor. And the pastor looks at it and takes it and he goes, uh, thank you, little Billy. Uh, what's this for? He said, oh, uh, that's because my dad says you're the poorest preacher we've ever had in this church since he's been coming here. Uh, out of the mouth of babes, right? All right. Yeah, I know. Don't quit my day job. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely not George Carlin. Too bad George Carlin wasn't a believer. He he could have brought a lot of people to Christ. He was really, uh, even though I didn't agree with him uh, spiritually, he was on the money on a lot of things. So, all right, let's take a look at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 31. Now, this is, uh, this a uh, uh, hundred years ago, this was common knowledge, what I'm getting ready to read you. Common knowledge. The word Adam is a racial description. Look it up in an old, old Strong's, uh, pre-1990. Strong's. Uh, should say ruddy. Look up the word ruddy in Webster's 1828 Dictionary. So, let's read Ezekiel chapter 31. And it mentions waters. Ezekiel 31, 1. And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the third month, in the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying... Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude. Whom art thou like in thy greatness? Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of an high stature, and his top was among the thick bowels. The Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches. What are they talking about? Is he a, a tree? Well, a family tree. That's what, you know, basically the Bible's using symbolism here. Verse, verse 4. The waters made him great. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high with her rivers running round about her his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Now, usually the Old Testament interprets the uh, New Testament. And that's what I love about the King James. The Bible interprets the Bible. If you use a modern translation, they change the words and you don't make the connections. But sometimes the New Testament will interpret the Old Testament. Now well, let's take a look at an example. I, I'm going to do two examples. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Now the serpent, the serpent, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Ah, oh, we're talking about trees in the garden. Talking serpent here. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Um, you know, but you know the rest of the story, right? Verse, And then Genesis 3, 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, right? Now, who is this serpent? Well, guess what? Bible interprets 
the Bible. Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 12 and verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil and Satan. You get the point? Here is an instance where the New Testament interprets the Old Testament. Who was the serpent in the garden? And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Huh. And then in Ezekiel 31, they're talking about the Assyrian being a cedar a tree in the gar in the garden. And what was God what did God tell uh, Eve and Adam not to play with the tree of good no uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Huh. Very very interesting as uh, Marty uh, what's his name used to say and laugh in. And if you remember that you're old Let's go back to Ezekiel 31. Well, before we do that, let's take a look at one more thing. All right, let's take a look at something. In Revelation 13 and verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast, a beast rise up out of the sea. So here it is, your... Uh, John saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So he saw a beast rise up out of the sea. You know, and don't think about Godzilla coming out of the ocean. You know, that's not what it's all about. No. Nope, that's not what it is. So, is there a place where this is interpreted? Absolutely. Uh, let's go to Revelation chapter 17. Verse 11. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. The beast, right? And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings, one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful." Boy, that is humbling. Called, chosen, and faithful. Verse 15, here's the punchline. Here's the interpretation. And he said unto to me, The waters, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, you know, the sea, the waters, the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are people's, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. Sometimes when they're talking about water, they're talking about H2O. Put it in a glass, have a sip. Sometimes they're talking about the waters that thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. All right. Let's go back to Ezekiel 31. There's a lot of symbolism in the Bible. And honestly, the Lord does this because if you don't have the Spirit of the Lord, you ain't going to understand. It ain't just going to happen. Uh, let's take a look at that real quick. Well, Paul, a lot of people don't like Paul. I don't know. I don't get it. 
But in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. If you don't have spiritual discernment, you're out of luck, buddy. You're out of luck. All right. Let's go back to Ezekiel 31. Keep that in mind. Waters are sometimes people, and trees are sometimes people too. Ezekiel 31, 3. Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon. A cedar is a type of tree, people. The Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and with an of and high stature, and his top was among the thick bowels. The waters made him great. The deep set him up on high with her rivers running round about his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. Therefore his height was exalted above all the trees of the field. Family trees. And his boughs were multiplied and his branches became long because of the multitude of waters when he shot forth. All the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young and under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Thus he was fair in his greatness in the length of his branches for his root was by great waters. Listen to this carefully. Verse 8. The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. What was the garden of God? Was it not Eden? Was it not Eden? The cedars in the garden of God could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches. Listen carefully. So that all the trees of Eden, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Now, I ask you a question. Trees in Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Envy is an emotion, you know, like love, hate, envy. Uh, you know, those are emotions. Do trees have emotions? No. Trees do not have emotions. I'm sorry. Unless there's some secret knowledge that I'm not aware of, trees don't have emotion. So this is talking about a figure of speech. I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. So what was that tree of, of knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Huh? And the serpent. That old serpent called the devil and Satan is Genesis chapter 3 coming into focus a little bit here? So, were Adam and Eve the only two people in the Garden of Eden? Or were there other family trees like the Assyrian in the Garden of Eden? Uh, you know, take a look at verse 8 again. Read it again. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thyself in height and hast, hast shot up his top among the thick boughs and his heart is lifted up in his height, I have deli uh, therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. 
Ha. Now, if you want to read the rest of it, you can. But I'm going to skip to uh, verse 18. To whom art thou thus like in glory and in greatness among the trees of Eden? Yet shalt thou be brought down with the trees of Eden unto the nether parts of the earth. What is the nether parts of the earth? Probably hell, right? Thou shalt lie in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that are slain with the sword. Well, what trees are uncircumcised? This is Pharaoh and all his multitude, saith the Lord God. Wow. See, a hundred years ago, I, I had a, um, a theology book from the 1890s. Probably had horse glue and it had leather bindings. And it was on my bookshelf. And uh, at the time, I just was living up in uh, Knoxville and I relocated back to Florida to be with dad and I was you know looking for a job staying with dad and my book was on the bookshelf and my dad had a German or Doberman she was a really sweet dog she had been horribly abused I mean you just walk by her with a, a newspaper rolled up or a magazine and she'd run you'd pick up your shoes to put them on your feet she'd run she'd been horribly abused we never abused her, but the uh, he he rescued her from some rescue place. Some people uh, treated her horribly, and she was just afraid of everything. Sweet dog, really sweet. Well, one day she decided she wanted my 1890s Bible theology book for a chew toy, and she chewed it up. I it was just chewed up beyond recognition. I, I couldn't salvage it. And I just felt so bad, you know, I, I couldn't bring myself to hit her. She was such a sweet dog. But you know what? My point is, this kind of stuff was common knowledge back 100 years ago. You know, they tell you, well, you know, Adam and Eve were the first people. Well, there were other, evidently there were other family trees in the garden. You know? And like I said, Adam is a racial description. Look it up. I'm not making this stuff up. Um, you know, God does have a chosen people. He really does. And I think anybody, any, any group of people that uh, no matter where they live, if they honor the Lord, the Lord will hear them. Except for the... Uh, the fallen angel hybrids. I'm sorry. I don't think, I don't think they have a, a snowball's chance in hell. But uh, that's just my opinion. All right. So let's get going here. Oh, when you read about Leviathan, the the crooked serpent of the sea, uh, think about the waters being the nations, and you know the crooked serpent. Think of Satan. Um, you know, think about that. Okay, let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 1 real quick. In that day, what day? The second coming. In that day, the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish, shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. You know, everybody's thinking, uh, you know, a sea serpent. Well, when you realize that the sea is sometimes talking about the ocean of humanity, you know, and when you realize... Um, the dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, you know, things like this come to light, don't they? It makes sense. But what do I know? I'm just a guy that's read the Bible once or twice. All right, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 36. Um, Ezekiel is a, somewhat like uh, Isaiah. 
it's considered a major profit. Uh, not well, not so much more because it's major in importance, but rather in size, although I'm not belittling Ezekiel in the least. So Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 23. This is an end time verse, if you ask me. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. This is the Lord going to do this. This is not the United Nations a satanic, heathen, godless organization in 1948. Sorry. If you, if you want to f believe that the United Nations in 1948 is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy, oh, wait, it is. Let's take a look at that prophecy of the United godless, satanic United Nations in 1948 creating the, you, the state in the Middle East. Let's take a look at that prophecy it fulfilled. Well, let's go take a look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares. He sowed weeds and not and not and not marijuana weed, and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. This one verse right here destroys the pre-trib rapture. The tares get gathered first. Gather ye together first the tares, the weeds, the unbelievers. Is that country in the Middle East? Are they believers in Christ? Or are they rejectors of Christ? Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. The tares are being gathered into bundles. That's what the 1948 prophecy is. But it's the opposite of what the churches teach. And bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Oh, yeah. All right, let's go back to Ezekiel 36, verse 23. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profane among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. So far, I haven't seen the Lord bringing his people into the land. Verse 25, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. 
a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. Isn't that interesting? He's going to sprinkle clean water, make us clean from all our filthiness, cleanse us. A new heart also will we be given, and a new spirit will I put within you. Parallelism. Clean water, a new spirit. So, that's what I see. All right, let's go read the book of Amos. Amos is considered a minor prophet because of the size. And uh, we're going to go to chapter 8. I guess we're going to read the whole chapter. Now, remember, this is Lord's condemnation upon northern Israel that was taken captive by the Assyrians before Jerusalem, uh, which was taken captive by the Babylonians. The Lord's pronouncing judgment upon them because of their wickedness. Verse 1, Thus hath the Lord showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, O oh, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. Saying, When will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn, and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit? So in other words, they were... Uh, cheating people on the size of the weights and measures. You know, when you want to buy a, a pound or, let's say, 454, uh, you know, or, you know, a kilogram, 2.2 pounds, well, they were making it small. It wasn't a true pound or it wasn't quite a... a a kilogram and then when you would put your uh, a shekel was a weight of silver or gold it was a weight uh, just like in America do you know what a dollar actually is we don't have dollars anymore we got little pieces of paper that say dollar but they're not dollars if you look up an old-time definition of a dollar, a dollar was one ounce of 90% pure silver. That was a dollar. One ounce of 90% pure silver. That was, that is a dollar. And in England, they called it a pound sterling. It was a pound of sterling silver. That's back when money was worth something you know has anything changed making the e fall small that was their uh, volume I guess or their weight and the shekel great and falsifying the balances by deceit yeah you thought you're getting a pound or a kilogram wrong that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. The Lord hath, uh, so here it is, there, people are buying wheat and they think they're getting quality, but they're selling them the, the junk. Probably the floor sweepings, right? The Lord hath sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall not the land tremble for this? And every one mourn that dwelleth therein, and it shall rise up holy as a flood. Huh. And it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. 
physical application with a spiritually uh, meaning, right? The flood. America's being flooded by a heathen aliens. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. Uh, that is... Uh, you know what? I think this is a, a, a reference to uh, Christ. I think it was it was I think it was noon when when this when it became darkness. And even the Roman centurion that didn't believe was humbled and said, "Surely this is the son of God." But also in the book of Joel and I think in Matthew 24, Mark 13, uh, you could read where the the sun will and the moon will become darkness. So, I don't know. Now, that would be almost worthy of a study in and of itself. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day, and I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Here's the punchline. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. You know, it's funny. You can go all over the United States, especially in the Bible Belt, and there's a church on almost every corner. Are they preaching what they pre preached a hundred years ago? No, they're not. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. They're going to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. In the day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. They that swear by the sin of Samaria, and say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of Beersheba liveth, even they shall fall and never rise up again. Now remember, Dan was one of the first tribes that fell into apostasy. Matter of fact, Dan was called a serpent by the way. Uh, yeah. Matter of fact, there's some evidence that uh, there's a lot of rivers. Have you ever heard of the Danube River? Have you ever heard of Denmark? We call it Denmark. They call it Danmark. There is some evidence that uh, the uh, Danish were of the tribe of Dan. The Vikings, you know, Dan was an ocean-going tribe. So, just something to think about, you know. All right, uh... I'm not sure. I think I'm going to get ready. We're getting ready to close this out. Let's take a look at Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk 3.15. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses. Through the heap of great waters. Uh, how do horses go through the sea? Are they sea horses? No. 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 They're uh, talking about the sea of humanity. Thou didst walk through the sea with thine horses through the heap of great waters. Okay. 
Um, let's take a look at Zechariah chapter 14. And uh, Zechariah chapter 14. And we're going to close this out. This will be the end of the Old Testament. And then we'll do the New Testament. The New Testament is really going to be the good part. Um, I'm just kind of like doing the, laying the groundwork. You know, I've had people accuse me of pulling verses out of context, which is why I go into these, well, I won't say deep studies, but I cover it enough so that anybody that's listened, when somebody makes an accusation like that, it, it just doesn't stick. So, Yeah, let's read the whole chapter of Zechariah. Uh, this is an end time chapter, people. There's, I keep telling everybody, there's a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament. There really is. I think there's more uh, prophecy in the Old Testament than there is in the New. And people won't read it. But uh, they sure know about the uh, National Felons League, the NFL, or uh, the NBA where all those giants with their six toes are playing, I guess. All right, Zechariah, Z-E-C-H-A-R-I-A-H, -H, Zechariah. I always get Zechariah and Zephaniah mixed up. Chapter 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, end times, right? And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now, this happened uh, during the Babylonian uh, siege and captivity. So... Verse 3, but it also is going to happen again in the end times, right? Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Now remember, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives a lot to preach. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? Mount of Olives. I'm, you know, I'm not sure, but maybe Jesus was taken up into heaven from the Mount of Olives. I, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure, but it's, uh, if, if anybody knows for certainty, let me know. I don't want to look it up. I mean, we're already gone over an hour, and it's, it's going on five o'clock in the morning. I got people staying in the house with me, and uh, it's like the only quiet time I have, really. Okay, either that or I could say I'm an insomniac, right? Verse 4, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. When the Lord returns and sets his feet upon the Mount of Olives, it's going to split in two. Verse 5. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azale. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Huh. Remember, we're going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. We're going to be caught up together with him in the clouds. And if you're not caught up together in the clouds, it's the wrong Messiah. And remember, the false Messiah comes before Christ does. Somebody send a memo to the pre-trib rapture churches. Oh, wait, that's right. They don't believe this. No, they'd rather tickle people's ears 
and uh, pass that collection plate and, and preach about tithing. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it's a, it kills me. You know, there's just so few people that... Uh, it disgusts me. I hope the Lord gives me a flaming sword and sets me loose on the churches when he returns because I'll know exactly what to do. But, you know, the thing is, there was a times in my life I was just as worthy as the same punishment and wrath. But if we're not caught up together in the clouds, it's the wrong Messiah, people. The false Messiah comes first. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee, and it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light, and it shall be in that day that living waters, living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea, in summer and in winter shall it be. This is a prophecy. It's in the book of Revelation. We're going to cover this in part three. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. That'll be a blessed day. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. And all the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place, from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's winepress. And men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord shall uh, will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Listen carefully. Uh, remember that scene in Terminator, the Terminator movie? Uh, you know, there's not many movies that I actually liked, but there is a few. Um, one of my favorite movies was The Terminator. And... Uh, you know, the first movie. And uh, and when the second one came out, I thought, yeah, they're going to rehash it. But in some ways, I like the second movie even better than the first. But the thing is, remember when Sarah Connor was in the playground and she's on the outside by the fence and all the kids are playing in the playground and then there's a nukes explosion, a flash, and what happened? All their flesh disintegrated, was burned off their bones. Well, guess what? Um, all right, so here we are. We're going to look at uh, verse 12. Zechariah 14, 12. Think about, think about that uh, Terminator scene. But Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited, and this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Burned up. That's... That's how I see it. Now, I might be wrong, but that's how I see it. Verse 13. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold everyone on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. And Judah also shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel in great abundance. 
And so shall be the plague of the horse, of the mule, of the camel, and of the ass, and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents as this plague. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. You know, in the kingdom, we will keep the feast of tabernacles. Right now, I'm not so much worried about it because I'm not a Levit Levitical priest, to my knowledge, and I haven't been trained, and I'm not even sure what day the Feast of Tabernacles is. You got people that argue over when the dates are, and, you know, if there's confusion in that, I don't, if they don't know, I don't know. All right, so, um, so people are going to go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So if you don't uh, honor the king, you ain't going to get no rain. You ain't got no rain. You ain't going to have any crops. You're going to be living in a desert. Well, you'll be dying in a desert. Verse 18, And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, then uh, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. In that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord, and the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seeth therein. And in that day, and in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Uh, and then there's people who tell you, well, if the Canaanites believe in Jesus, they're going to get saved. Well, you know what? Argue with Zechariah. What can I tell you? All right. Uh, we're going to do part three. I think that'll part three will probably be the end. We're going to do the uh, New Testament waters and um, see where we go. It'll it'll probably be the best study of the three. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see what happens. All right. Um, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. In Jesus' precious name, amen.